This lecture is on competition and conflict in Europe connected to religion. So in the previous section, we talked about St. Francis. And um, I tried to contrast him with Joan of Arc, saying how he focused on the church, whereas Joan of Arc um, focused on the nation, right? St. Francis believed that he had been called on by God to um, serve the church, to rebuild the church, whereas St. Joan believed she had been called on by God to kick the English out of France. And that shows the kind of changing identity. But I do need to talk, go back and say a little bit more about Francis. Um, he was, like I said, kind of a reformer, right? He believed he had this memory, or he believed he had this vision where he'd been called on to rebuild the church. And he was a very devout and in many ways a kind of pure and simple person. So he said, okay, God has told me I have a, um, a duty uh, to rebuild the church. So I'm going to go tell uh, the Pope uh, that I have this duty to do. So the Francis goes and says, okay, I want to tell the Pope I'm here to rebuild the church. And the Pope's like, I have like a dozen people who come to me every day and tell me that they're going to rebuild the church. You know, I don't have time for this guy. I got to go do Pope things. And so what happens then is the story goes, the Pope had a dream in which St. Peter appeared to him. And um, if you've ever seen like a papal flag, the flag of the, the Pope and the papal states, it has the keys on it. Um, there's a part in the Bible where Jesus talks about the king, keys of the kingdom and gives them to Peter. And the uh, Pope see themselves and Catholics believe that the um, the popes are the successors of St. Peter and that spiritual authority has been handed down to them. So in the Pope's dream, he saw St. Peter pointing to um, St. Francis holding up a very important church. Basically to symbolize that, no, Francis is the real deal. He's totally going to reform the church. He's going to rebuild it. And the Pope then has Francis summoned and gives him permission to preach, to go out and try and call people to live to gospel standards. And in particular, Francis called on people to be humble, to love their neighbor, and to imitate Jesus, right? To embrace, embrace poverty and suffering out of love. And the story goes that Francis was so devout and so uh, centered on Jesus that the wounds of Jesus actually appeared on his body. Those are called stigmata. That's why he's got these little marks on his hands. Those are supposed to be from the nail wounds. The key point what I want to emphasize here with Francis is that anytime you have any institution with power, there's always the danger of corruption. And I'll talk more about that shortly. And the Catholic Church, like any institution, often goes through a cycle of corruption and purification. So Francis was one of these reformers who came about when there were lots of problems within the Catholic Church and tried to fix those problems and to extent did it to so well to such an extent the Catholic Church is able to keep going. And to give you an example of like the kind of innovations he developed to try and encourage people to follow Jesus uh, more devoutly, he's the guy that developed the nativity scene, right? You may have seen things like this. People will put them up in their yards or in churches where they have a little barn where Jesus and Mary, or I'm sorry, Joseph and Mary are, and there's the baby Jesus and the animals and the, the uh, angels. Francis is the one who invented that. And this is a, a depiction of the first uh, nativity scene where Francis is putting the baby Jesus into a uh, his little cradle. Right? And there's the animals, except they used live animals, which is kind of cool. But that's the kind of thing Francis did. That's the kind of thing reformers do, trying to come up with new devotions to help get people back to the center. And of course, the center of Christianity is Jesus. Well, that's great for the 12th and 13th century, but problems in the Catholic Church are going to come back, especially in the 15th and early 16th century. There's going to be a lot of problems. So there's a problem in the marriage of church and state in that the state, remember, gives a lot of resources to the church and the church becomes quite wealthy and powerful. And anytime you have wealth and power, that leads to corruption. You can kind of think about it this way. When Christians are being persecuted for being a Christian, only, generally speaking, only someone who really believes devoutly in Christianity wants to be a church leader, right? If you can get killed for being a, a, a Christian and the government's most likely to kill church leaders because they attract the most attention, you're probably going to really believe in Christianity and be serious about it if you're willing to be a church leader. But what happens when the church is popular? When the church is supported by the government, when becoming a church leader gives you a position of power, 
Well, you're going to get people who don't care about the church and don't care about Jesus, but do care a lot about power, and that naturally leads to corruption. So I've talked about bishops, but just as a reminder, bishops are church leaders, and typically in the Middle Ages, they have access to resources to carry out their work. This is usually land. So a bishop, in order to do the job of the church, to worship God and also to take care of the poor and the sick and the hungry and all that, has resources, usually in the form of land. Well, to give you an example of something that was happening that was really corrupt in the 15th century, people would purchase the office of bishop in order to gain access to those resources, right? So I want to be, um, you know, the church has a lot of land. I've got some money. I'm going to go and uh, give some bribes to the church so I can be appointed bishop. Not because I want to be a church leader, but because I want access to that land. Once I become bishop, you know what? I'm not going to use all that money to take care of the church or to worship God or give money to the poor or do any of those things. I'm going to give that money to myself. I'm going to keep it myself. So you're going to take church money, money that's supposed to be going to upkeep the church, take care of the poor. You're going to keep it for yourself. And this was called simony. And this is from the Bible. There's a guy, Simon Magus or Simon the Magician. He sees Peter healing people and he says, hey, how do you do that magic trick? I'll pay you if you tell me. And Peter is horrified by this and says, you know, I do this by the power of God, not by anything that I do. It's, it's God that does it, not so much me. And this is used, for, simony means to try and buy or to purchase spiritual goods with money. You're not supposed to do that, right? You're not supposed to be able to buy the office of bishop, but there's so much corruption here, it's happening. And to give you a sense about how bad it is, some people will buy multiple bishop uh, positions and then pay someone else to do their job for them. So you kind of think about it this way. I'm going to buy five different bishop positions, each of which pays me $100,000 a year. I'm going to spend $10,000 on each position to hire some guy to do my job for me. Imagine if you could pay people to work for you, right? And then they have to give you like their wages, uh, a big portion of that, right? You could work, work, work like five jobs and you make a huge amount of money. And that's basically what's happening. But you better believe that this is not good for the church, right? Because you have people who don't actually really care about Christianity leading and they're using the money that's supposed to be going to like help the poor and, you know, worship God and stuff. They're using that to line their own pocket. So it's a big problem. Now, Catholic re reformers exist. There are people who want to be like Francis and reform the church. But unlike Francis, they're never able to get a powerful pope to back them. And there's popes who want to reform this. They don't like this, but they're too weak. Right? Catholic re reformers exist, but they're too weak to change things in most places. So here's a problem. During this time period, there's actually a growing religious demand. People seem during this time period, in part because of growing literacy, I think, to be, want to become more religious. And they're wanting to become more religious at a time where the Catholic Church is has, having problems meeting religious demands. So you're going to have a problem, right? More people want more religion, and the church is less able to give it to them. The spark that's going to cause a kind of problems has to do with Catholic teachings on purgatory. Right? So if you're familiar with Christianity, you're probably used to thinking, you know, you die and you either go to hell or you go to heaven. But Catholics believe in another place called purgatory. And you can almost think of purgatory as heaven's waiting room. And I don't mean any, I'm not trying to, to make fun of this doctrine. Um, but you can kind of think about like heaven's waiting room. If you die and you go to purgatory, you're not going to hell. You're going to heaven eventually. But before you go to heaven, you have to pay the penalty for your sins that have been forgiven. There's this idea that you have to kind of make up for your sins. Yes, by accepting Jesus, by believing in Jesus, your sins have been forgiven, but you still got to kind of make up for them. You can kind of think about it this way, right? If you break a window, you know, you're playing baseball and you break a window and you ask the homeowner for forgiveness, the homeowner will probably forgive you, but also maybe you should pay for the window to be replaced, right? So, I don't, this isn't a, a religion class. I don't want to go into deeper detail now. I'm just trying to explain how Catholics understand this. And also there's this idea that you have to be purified before you go into heaven, right? Are you really ready to go into heaven now? Like you're still kind of want to sin, you know, you've still done some bad things. Maybe you need to be purified. And it's interesting because images of uh, purgatory often look similar to images of hell because they both involve fire. But the fires of purgatory do not, 
um, punish you, they purify you. Right? That's kind of the idea. So purgatory is like heaven's waiting room. Have to pay the penalty for your sins and you need to be pur purified. Now here's the thing. You can get an indulgence to decrease your time in purgatory. You can go ahead and do something that will purify you in this earth. You can go ahead and do something that will pay, this, pay, pay the penalty for your sins in this earth. That's fine. Right? So, you know, I've done some bad things. Um, I'm still alive. I know I'm going to do something. I know I'm going to serve time in purgatory. Well, why don't I just start that process of purification? Why don't I start that process of paying the penalty for my sins? That's easy to do. I'll get an indulgence. Now, how do you get an indulgence? Usually through acts of faith, such as going on a pilgrimage, praying, reading the scriptures, or charity, giving, um, giving uh, money to the poor. And what's interesting, too, and you can see where Catholicism is a very group-oriented religion, you can do this for yourself or for others. So I can get an indulgence for myself, or I could be like, you know, uh, my dad passed away. I love my dad. He was a good person. He's probably in heaven, but he did some bad things, so I'll do an indulgence to get him out of purgatory quicker. But that's the idea. Now, here's the problem. It's really easy to slide into corruption with this doctrine and with anything, and what ended up happening was this began to be used for fundraising, right? You know, you get an indulgence for giving money to the poor, right? Well, doesn't the church take care of the poor, right? So why don't you just give money to the church? And so indulgences kind of became used for fundraising. And this is an example of an indulgence here. You would get the certificate if you donate a certain amount of money to build a shrine. And this could easily shift from being a pious practice to just being a way to raise money to build fancy churches for bishops who don't really care about the religion but just want to show off. Now, I want to stress, I'm not criticizing this doctrine theologically. I'm just trying to explain what happened historically, right? Anything that's good can be misused, right? And I'm not making a judgment about this. I'm just trying to say that what ends up happening is this practice, which was meant to encourage people to do charity and to engage in acts of faith to purify themselves and so forth, is becoming corrupted in the 15th century and becomes a way to raise funds to build fancy churches. You know who didn't like that? Martin Luther did not like that, right? Martin Luther really did not like this practice. Well, who was Martin Luther? Well, as a spoiler alert, if you're not familiar with Martin Luther, he's basically the guy who starts Protestant Christianity. Martin Luther, though, started life as a Catholic, right? He starts life as a Catholic, and he was a Catholic monk who always felt guilty. He would spend hours confessing his sins, and it seemed that no matter how much and how, uh, how much he confessed, he always still felt guilty about it, right? So he was someone who had a deep sense of guilt. And he was at a monastery, and basically the had, head monk called an abbot said, you know, Martin Luther, your problem is you're spending all this time thinking about your sins. You're thinking about yourself. We need to get you doing something. You need to go become a teacher. Go become a professor. They opened up this new university in a place called Wittenberg. Go there and teach scripture. You'll be so focused on teaching and on your students that you'll you, you'll just naturally won't sin because you'll be too busy and you'll too be busy to thinking about sin. Um, so that's what you're going to do. Get your mind off being a sinner. Go do some good work. That's really good for you now. Don't don't sit around just thinking about how you're a sinner. Go out, love your neighbor, do some good. So Luther goes off and becomes a professor teaching scripture. And what happens is he develops his own interpretation of the Bible that gives him a sense of forgiveness of peace. He come, becomes convinced that simply through faith alone, he's saved. Don't need to worry about purgatory. Don't need to worry about doing good works. Faith alone will get him to heaven. And suddenly he feels peace. He doesn't feel that sense of guilt anymore. So he believes very strongly in this, right? His experience seems to say that this is correct. So he will begin to criticize indulgences and other traditional Catholic teachings by appealing to the Bible and arguing that we should only use the Bible. Again, this isn't a religion class, but Catholics believe that both the Bible and tradition, by which they means the teachings of earlier Christians and early Christian practices, are sources of doctrine. Protestants generally believe that only the Bible is the source of doctrine. So Luther will criticize indulgences and other traditional Catholic teachings by appealing to the Bible. And he has powerful protectors, and that will enable his teachings to spread. Now, this is important to understand in and of itself, but kind of going back to our theme, 
we're going to have a breakup of Christendom. Some countries will and areas will accept Luther's understanding of Christianity and go Protestant. Others will, ex will remain Catholic. This will encourage further competition and conflict, right? Catholics and Protestants will be in competition with each other in part to show that their religion is correct and they'll be in wars with each other even over religion, right? But the key thing is this encourages further competition and conflict. And to give you a kind of a concrete example about how this will help develop the age of exploration, now I do want to point out Columbus sails before Christopher Columbus launches the Protestant Reformation in 1517, um, but this is going to kind of help that age of exploration develop and the competition develop, which will help, you know, put make Europe the one that reconnects uh, this divided world. What's going to happen is Catholics, some Catholics, of course, will become Protestant, but a lot of Catholics, as we saw on that map, will stay Catholic. And the Catholic Church, rather than trying to compromise the Protestants or change its doctrine, will restrain, tr restate traditional teachings at what's called the Council of Trent. When Catholics have a big problem, they try and solve it by, by calling a council where all these different bishops from all over the Catholic world come together and figure out what needs to be done. And their answer was not to compromise, was not to change Catholic doctrine, but to restate traditional teachings. While emphasizing the need to clean up corruption, right? They're going to really focus on cleaning up corruption, and they do a good job of that, actually. One thing that comes out of this is the formation of what's called the Society of Jesus, what's also known uh, as the Jesuits, by Ignatius of Loyola. Uh, Lo Lo Ignatius of Loyola started off as a soldier. Uh, he was heavily wounded in a battle by a cannonball, of all things. It bounced a few times and whacked his leg. And he was severely injured and had to rest in a, and recuperate in a, a castle where the people were really religious. And the only thing available were religious books. And he was bored and he had nothing to do but these religious read these religious books. And eventually he had a conversion experience and rededicated himself to Jesus. Um, but he does this, of course, in a very Catholic way. So he's kind of the opposite of Luther, much more similar to St. Francis. And he's going to form this organization called the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits. It's interesting. They focus on education and missionary work. The Jesuits go to China, to J India, to Japan, and North America. And they're doing this because there's this kind of urge to go out and convert people because they say, look, all these souls were lost to Protestant Christianity. All these people became Protestant. We need to try and get them to be Catholic again. But you know what? We also need to, we've been kind of lazy. We need to go out there and try and preach the gospel to all the world. So these Jesuits, in addition to becoming teachers, are going to become missionaries going out all over the world, continuing this kind of competition. So you can see how competition between Catholics and Protestants is going to help drive the age of expiration. Now, like I said, this happens technically after Columbus. But I do want to stress the the age of expiration goes on for a long time. And this kind of rivalry continues. This will also, of course, lead to Christianity becoming a more global religion. right? It, at this time period, it was much more European with some pockets of Christians in the Middle East and Africa. But it's going to become much more global after this. But like I said, the co competition for souls is going to encourage exploration and missionary work, helping lay the grounds for this rejoining, this building of this system of, uh, of the old and new worlds being combined. I just want to point out um, that the Jesuits are still around. They still do uh, interesting work. I was part of a conference uh, a few years ago uh, called by this Jesuit, Father Antoni, and we were brought um, to talk uh, together in Canada at a old Jesuit mission for Native Americans. And we were brought together to talk about the compare and contrast Native American and East Asian uh Catholicism. And I was brought in because I'm a specialist in Korea. And there's the Jesuit who's in charge. And there's me. And that's all these fun people here together. So uh, Jesuits still around today. But like I said, we can see here how religious competition is going to help drive Europeans to go out and compete with each other, go out and explore and build these international connections.